It's so interesting that in this video, he says that come to this channel to distinguish the difference between truth and error. And as you're going to see from our video here, the rest of his video contains numerous errors, countless errors about Catholicism, which we are going to debunk in this video. So it's ironic that he claims to speak truth, then goes on to speak errors, the errors that we're going to talk about right after this. Hello everyone, my name is Brian Mercier, President of Catholic Truth. We want to help you to know, love, live, and defend your Catholic faith. We want to inspire you in your Catholic faith and even help non-Catholics to understand what we believe. If you would like a retreat speaker, a keynote speaker, if you would like us to come to your parish, check out our website down below, catholictruth.org. And if you would like to support our ministry, our PayPal, and our Patreon are below for one-time donations or monthly donations. Thank you in advance. And if you would like to follow us on social media, all down below. So this man makes a lot of claims about Catholicism, most of which are wrong. So let's see what he has to say, and then we will answer his charges. What is the gospel? Well, Roman Catholics often, when you ask them this question, they usually say, well, we believe in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that's not what Paul means when he says the Gospel. What Paul means is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to read this to you because Paul here clearly recounts the Gospel. And this is the Gospel that you must believe in order to be saved. If you don't believe this, then you're not saved and you're not truly a Christian. Let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. This here is the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day. He says, when you ask many Catholics what the gospel is, they say, we believe in all four gospels. <laughs> this isn't any better than Ray Comfort, who goes to Catholics who don't know their faith, rather than going to see what the Catholic Church actually teaches. The Catholic Church teaches the gospel, the same gospel that he presents here, the Catholic Church has taught for 2,000 years. So he's creating a false dichotomy that, oh, well, we Christians teach the gospel, whereas Catholics don't know what the gospel is. We have taught the gospel before you were even in your mummy's belly. <laughs> no offense, but you're just a noob at this. We've been teaching the gospel for 2,000 years, and everything he said was the gospel we have taught. So I don't understand. I mean, it either shows that he hasn't studied Catholicism, he hasn't even picked up a book to look up what Catholics believe, or he's just being intellectually dishonest. I think it's funny that he says, if you don't accept this gospel, then you're not saved. And if you do, then you are saved. Well, by that logic, we're saved as Catholics because we've accepted it for 2,000 years. But just so you don't have to take my word for it, we're going to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the official catechism. Listen to what it says. The name Jesus signifies that the very name of God is present in the person of his Son, made man, for the universal and definitive redemption of sins. It is the divine name that alone brings salvation, and henceforth all can invoke his name. For Jesus united himself to all men through his incarnation, so that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. So the Catholic Church is clear, among a thousand other quotes I could mention, that Jesus is the only Savior, and it happened by his cross, his death, and his resurrection. And it's through his cross and resurrection, through himself uniting himself through, to our humanity and reconciling us back to the Father. I mean, that's basically what he said, and I could read a hundred other quotes, but the fact is we have taught that Jesus alone is the Savior because of his death and resurrection, and we have to believe this to be saved. Now, when it says here he died for our sins, it's saying he died a substitutionary death for our sins in our place. Now, this is where the problem begins. He starts to teach about a substitutionary atonement. 
We were in agreement with him up to this point. We agreed that Jesus is the only Savior, that we have to accept Christ as our Savior, that it's his body and blood which saves us and redeems us. We all agree. Christians across the board agree on this. However, the majority of Christians do not agree with substitutionary atonement. This is his own personal gospel. And in fact, it's not his, it's John Calvin's, because it was never heard of before John Calvin's. He said, oh, it's just biblical. No, that's John Calvin's personal interpretation, which is why no one in 1,500 years actually saw that in the Bible or believed that. And it's not any better than Mormonism to say that God waited 1,500 years to reveal his true gospel. And Mormons say, oh, he waited 1,700 years, 1,800 years to reveal his true gospel. No, it was never heard of in the history of the church. Jesus died for our sins. Yes. He shed his body and blood for us. Yes. He reconciled us back to the Father. Yes. He satisfied the justice of God. Yes. Where does it say that he substituted himself in our place? It doesn't say anything about that. I mean, he mentions the Old Testament, and he talks about how that was a substitutionary atonement, and Old Testament things pointed toward the New Testament, which is true. That doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus was a substitutionary atonement, since the New Covenant is better and more perfect. Just as circumcision in Colossians chapter 2 points to baptism, baptism is not the same as circumcision. Baptism is more supreme, more infinite, better than circumcision. And so is the Lord's Supper, then Passover. Everything is better and more preeminent in the New Testament. It's not the same as the Old Testament. What he quoted just said that Jesus died and was buried and raised on the third day. It doesn't say he was substituted in our place. That's something he's reading into this belief, his own beliefs into the Bible. And our beliefs are almost the same except for this point. And I like what Jimmy Aiken has to say on this. Jimmy Aiken talks about St. Anselm in the, in the 4th century, I believe, 5th century. And he talks about a possible substitutionary atonement as well, not the Calvinistic version. He says that he satisfied the justice of God, restoring the honor of God, which man has offended by sin. So since on this view, Christ satisfied God on our behalf, i.e. vicariously, theories of this nature are sometimes called vicarious satisfaction theories. When Jesus describes what he did for us as a ransom, he didn't mean that he literally was going to offer a sum of money on our behalf. He's using a metaphor, as is evident from the fact that he says he will give his life as a ransom for many. Thus, Aquinas acknowledges that one can speak of a person voluntarily taking on the punishment of another, as when one voluntarily pays a fine on someone's behalf. But this is only punishment in a qualified sense. It isn't punishment in the full normal sense because the person who pays the fine is innocent, and so paying the fine voluntarily does not have a penal character. He goes on to say that what we all agree and have agreed for 2,000 years, that we don't believe that Jesus was punished for our sins in our place. Why? Because he did nothing wrong. He was innocent. And so for God to take an innocent person and just destroy him and punish him and send him to hell to burn for our sins is wrong. It's morally wrong. It's unjust. And the Bible from beginning to end says that God is a God of justice. And if God is a God of justice, he doesn't act unjustly. And to punish someone who is not guilty for someone else's sins is unjust. And of course, as I just said, the extreme of this, which John MacArthur teaches, is that Jesus actually went to hell for a few days and burned there on our behalf. That is just nonsense. I mean, I don't know any Christian in history who believes that except for maybe Calvin MacArthur and a few other of their cronies, but this is not a Christian belief. But yet, this is what this guy seems to be teaching, a substitutionary atonement. And again, this is not Catholic versus Protestant. You know, true Christians versus those Catholics. Most Protestants do not accept this. This is a Calvinistic teaching. Some evangelicals believe it. A few non-denominationals believe it. But the majority of Protestants do not accept this. They do accept that Jesus died for us, but they do not accept the substitutionary atonement as these people teach. The Bible is very clear when you read the New Testament that we are saved by believing the gospel. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In this section, he says that Martin Luther did not invent faith alone. It's biblical. 
Sure, nobody ever heard of it for 1,300 years, but it's biblical. Substitutionary atonement, no one ever heard of it for 1,500 years, but it's biblical. Same thing that Mormons claim, Jesus and Satan are brothers, and other claims, oh, it's biblical. You know, but no, no one believed it because it's not biblical. Here's the deal. He reads 1 Corinthians 15 again, which says that we must believe in the gospel. He says, all you need to do is believe in the gospel and you're saved. That's what he says, and he says that's what Luther taught, even though that's not what Luther taught. These Protestants are so confused. This is what happens when you don't do any real research. Martin Luther said that baptism was necessary for salvation as part of faith alone because it's a, the work of God and a command of God. So we have to be baptismally regenerated to go to heaven. So you don't just believe according to Martin Luther. This is a, a later addition. So it, it doesn't even say that here in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at what 1 Corinthians 15 says. The gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Does that say just believe in the gospel and you're saved? No, it doesn't. Why do Protestants just read their theology into the Bible? It's called eisegesis. Look at what this says. It says, the gospel that I preached to you, which you have received, great, they received the gospel Paul gave, and in which you stand. They're standing in it. Good. That's a good thing. And by which you are being saved. Greek, present tense, not past tense, not you have been saved, not you're good, you're automatically going to heaven. No, you're currently being saved continuously, present tense, by this gospel. If, if what? If you hold fast to the word I preached to you. So what happens if we stop holding fast to the words that Paul preached to us? The gospel is clear that we're not going to be saved because it says we will have believed in vain. That's why Paul warns us in the New Testament, warns us almost a hundred times that we can fall away from the faith. Even Paul in Romans 11, 16 through 22 says, if you don't continue in God's kindness, yes, you're there because of belief. But if you stop believing, then you are like an unbeliever and you will fall away from the faith. And the Bible says you will be cut off. If you continue in his kindness, great, salvation. If not, you will be cut off like the Jews were. It's pretty harsh language. And in fact, it's Paul in Hebrews 10, 26 that says you can blaspheme the blood of Christ and lose your salvation because of going back to your old ways of living. It's also Paul that says we are born again through baptism in Romans 6, 1 through 11. I could name a lot more things that say not just believing. So, we don't just believe. I mean, even the demons believe. Even the demons believe, James chapter 2 says. So we don't just believe. What does believe mean anyways? Biblically speaking, it means to follow and obey Christ. That's what the devil didn't do. Yes, he believed. Oh, he believes more than we do. He knows Christ more than we do. And he chooses not to follow and not to obey. So if we truly are, uh, are followers of Christ and we truly believe we will follow him and his commandments and we will obey him and his holy will. Matthew 7, 21 and 1 John 2, 3 through 4, Matthew 19, 16 through 23 and so on and so on. The bottom line is it's not just blind belief. Ephesians 2, he says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And in the context, works of the law includes the moral law, because a few verses earlier, he says, Through the law is the knowledge of sin. So clearly it includes the moral law. This is not something that Luther came up with. In this section, he tries to prove faith alone, and he just regurgitates the same old dusty Protestant arguments that don't hold up and don't work. He quotes Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. He says, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works. They love to stress, not of works. But it doesn't say one thing. It doesn't say, by grace you have been saved through faith alone. That's what Protestants add. That's not what it says. It says you have been saved by grace through faith, which we agree, but it never says faith alone. James debunks that. 
James says you are not justified by faith alone. And in fact, that's the only time in the entire Bible those two little words are mentioned back to back, side by side, faith alone. And it says you are not justified by faith alone, period. So therefore, uh, Ephesians 2 can't be talking about faith alone. It's talking about faith, yes, but not faith alone. He might say yes, but it says not of works, not of works. We're not talking about good works here. Good works are not being talked about in this passage. Works of ourselves, us trying to save ourselves and get ourselves to heaven is being talked about. That's why if you read back a few verses, it talks about when they were pagans and they didn't know Christ. They were estranged from Christ. So this is the first time we have come to Christ. We don't even know who he is and he's drawing us freely by his grace. Something we can't do by our own power in which we agree. Protestants and Catholics across the board agree that it's grace that saves us and we can't save ourselves. So, is it faith alone, though? No, it's grace. And we can't have faith without grace, and we can't do works without grace. It's also talking about works of the law, which if you go back and read a few verses, it's talking about the works of the law, which is the Mosaic law, the, the law of Moses, circumcision, dietary laws, things like that. He's saying these things don't save you which we agree. But then in the very next verse, he says, you must go out and walk in good works, which God has ordained you to walk in. So he makes a distinction between works and good works. Did you notice he didn't say we are saved by grace through faith without good works? No, no, no. He goes on to say we must walk in good works. Now ask the question, what if we don't walk in good works? Are we going to be saved? Protestants, some Protestants would probably say yes. Others would definitely say no. Catholics would definitely say no. No, a true, living, salvific faith that saves is one that lives itself out in obedience to Christ's commandments, stays faithful to the gospel. Remember, Paul says, if you stand in the gospel. Well, what happens if you stop standing in the gospel? What happens if you stop accepting his words? No, we believe we have to live out our faith every day until the end. And I recently just had a couple of Lutherans uh, message me on our YouTube's comment section said, we agree with you 100%. You have to live out that faith or it's vain faith. It doesn't save. And this is especially true since Paul says we need to do works. Like in Philippians 2.12, which says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Or Romans 2, 6 through 7, which says that God will render to each person according to his works. And if you're faithful and obedient, eternal life, and if not, destruction. And also Revelation 20, 12, and 13, which says that we are judged by our works. Also Galatians 5, 6, which says that nothing matters except faith working through love. So all throughout the New Testament, including Paul's writings, we see faith and obedience working side by side. Even here in Romans 16, 25 through 27, it talks about the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Several times Paul mentions faith and obedience, obedience of faith side by side, because true faith is obedient to Christ. Then he goes on to talk about Romans 3.28, which says we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And Protestants love to say, see, faith apart from works. But notice it says works apart from the law. Again, these are dietary laws. This is the Mosaic law. These are things like circumcision, which the Jews thought saved them. And, it, and he was saying you can't be saved by these things. This is the same in Romans chapter 4 as well, where he says that Abraham was justified by faith apart from works. He's not talking about good works here. He's talking about works of the law, Mosaic law. I mean, circumcision. In fact, in Romans chapter 4, the word circumcision is used nine times times because that is the works that Paul is thinking about. It's circumcision. Jews thought they were saved just by merely being circumcised. No matter how they lived, they were good. They were saved. Very similar to Protestants today, once saved, always saved. That's ironic. But the bottom line is, this: he never condemns good works. Not once in the entire New Testament does Paul say that you do not need good works, or good works don't save you, or good works aren't part of faith. No, he says just the opposite. Anytime he mentions works, he's talking about, like 99% of the time, the Mosaic Law, or works done by our own power. He tries to save him and his arguments by saying that the moral law is included in this, but the moral law is not included in this. Jesus himself said you have to follow the commandments in Matthew 19, 15 through 23. And the first letter of John says, if you don't follow the commandments, you are a liar and the truth of God isn't in you. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Paul says 
list several commandments and said, if you don't follow these and you continue to break these, you're not going to heaven. And Galatians 5, 17 through 22 talks about the war between the spirit and the flesh. And he says that if you do these things, these immoral things, constantly, Paul is saying, don't live immorally. You must live moral, moral, moral. And if you don't, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I challenge you to read these verses. It's all over the New Testament, and this man is desperately trying to save himself and his arguments, and it just doesn't hold up. You can also look up John 14, 15, and verses 21 through 24, and John 15, 5 through 7, 10, and 14. I mean, Jesus is clear. We need to follow the commandments, be obedient to him, stay faithful to him, and bear good fruit. That doesn't sound like just believing. Now, Romans 3.28 here, where it says we are saved by faith apart from the works of the law, this is the exact verse that Martin Luther added the word alone to in his German translation. So his read that we are justified by faith alone apart from works of the law, and he added to the holy word of God just to prove his man-made doctrine. And they say we add to the word of God, but he actually added to the word of God, and he got mad at the Catholic Church for calling him out on it. And he really didn't like the book of James because it said we are not justified by faith alone, at literally disproved his man-made tradition, and that's why he said he felt like throwing little Jimmy into the fire, because he did not like the book of James. Then he goes on, I didn't play this clip of his video, but he goes on to play Bishop Barron, who says, we agree with Protestants on a lot of these things, and even Martin Luther, we agree with a lot on a lot of these things, but not on the word alone, unless it's understood in the right way. The way that many Protestants understand it today is not correct, but we can agree with Luther on faith alone if It's not an empty faith. It's a living, working, breathing, obedient faith that lives itself out in obedience to the gospel. Yes, then it's faith that saves us. We can't save ourselves. Works don't do anything. Works are done out of love and because of faith and by the grace of God. To be justified in the context of the New Testament means to be regarded as innocent. We are justified. We are legally declared innocent by God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins. See, this is false theology. This is false Calvinistic theology. Never heard of in the history of the church for 1,500 years. This is not from Christ. It's not biblical. Again, this is where God lies to you and tells you that you are righteous, even though you're a dunghill, even though you're you're garbage, even though you're you're not righteous, God's gonna lie to you and tell you you are. That is not what we believe. We don't believe in imputed righteousness. The Catholic Church believes that God is so much more powerful than that, that when he declares you righteous, he actually makes you righteous by his power, through his spirit. He regenerates you from within and makes you new, like 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 says that we become a new creation. We actually become a new creation. And then over our life through sanctification, God is actually sanctifying us, purifying us, and making us more holy like himself so that we share more and more in his divine life. The bottom line is that nobody believes this man's straw man arguments. Both Catholics and Protestants across the board believe that faith comes first and then works. Not works. You can't work your way to heaven. And the Catholic Church has never taught that. And in fact, the Catholic Church condemns that. It's faith and then works. Or as we should say, a working faith. And I would just say as a side note that this man teaches more of a pagan theology. That's what Calvin taught, a pagan theology. This substitutionary atonement is found across Indian and pagan uh, religions, ancient religions that used to believe they needed to satisfy the wrath of their gods, their, their seething gods who couldn't be appeased. They actually had to be appeased by blood. And so they would sacrifice these innocent people to appease the blood of the gods that they worshiped. And that's what Calvin's theory proposes too, that God is so wrathful. And you hear this with MacArthur all the time, John MacArthur, that God's wrath, God's wrath, God's wrath. And they say Catholics think God's angry. They're obsessed with God's anger and his wrath. And someone had to appease it. And so we're going to just going to take this innocent person who didn't do anything wrong and he's going to do it. That's pagans. That's what pagans believe. That's not what Christians believe. We believe that Jesus freely chose to give up his life out of love for us, not to substitute it, but to sacrifice it out of love for us. He didn't substitute us in our place. He, God didn't take him, who was innocent, and punish him, even though he was 
in a sin and he punished him as if he was guilty, even though he wasn't. No, Jesus freely chose to give, give up his life for us so that we could be reconciled back to him. There's a big difference between those two worldviews. Moreover, I would challenge this man to his face or in a debate if he wants to show me one place in the entire Bible where it says all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, as he claims. The Bible doesn't say that. But show me a verse where it says that, please. Where does the Bible say that all your sins, when you come to Christ, they're forgiven, past, present, and future, even though you haven't committed them yet? <laughs> your sins in the future, you haven't even been there yet. You haven't even committed them yet. You haven't even had the chance of repenting of them yet. And yet, he says they're already forgiven. That doesn't even make sense. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. Same thing in the first letter of John. He says that if we sin, we have a Savior and we must confess those sins and we can be forgiven. But the bottom line is we're not forgiven of sins before we even commit them all at once in one moment forever in eternity. That's false theology. No one in the history of the church ever taught that. What the Bible does teach is that there are three different kinds of salvation. I mean, there's many different kinds of salvation mentioned in the Bible, but it talks about salvation in a past tense. You have been saved, like in Ephesians 2.8 or 1 Corinthians 6.11. But in other verses, it says you are being saved, like we've already shown in 1 Corinthians 15. It says you are being saved by the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.18 also talks about being saved, present tense, still happening. And then, of course, it speaks of a future tense as well, like in Romans 2.7, where it says, if you persevere and do what's right, you will be saved. And also Matthew 10.22 and many other verses talk about continuing to the end, persevering to the end. If you don't persevere to the end, you then you will be saved or you won't be saved. So instead of this man's claim that salvation is a one-time moment, the Bible actually says that it's happened in the past. It's still continuing now. And if we stay faithful, it will happen in the end as well. That's the biblical model. If they're saved, they're not sure if they're saved. They, they hope so. May God put me so. But they don't know for sure whether they are saved. But the Bible tells us very clearly that we have peace with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ, that we have boldness to enter into the most holy place through the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul says again, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And of course, the works of the law there includes the moral law because he says, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We as Christians have peace with God. We, when we believe the gospel, when we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he, he paid the penalty that we deserve. When, when we see that, that Jesus died a substitutionary death for our sins, we can have faith that we can stand before God on judgment day and enter into his presence because of what he did on the cross for us. He says we are forgiven of all of our sins in this section again, and then goes on to list these verses. And if you actually read the verses, none of them actually say we're forgiven of all of our sins all at one moment and we're saved forever. None of those verses he quotes say that. This is my biggest frustration with Protestants is they don't, they just regurgitate these things. They don't actually read these things in depth. They don't read them in context. He says we have peace through the blood of Jesus Christ, which we agree. But that's presuming that you stay in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's presuming that you stay faithful to him. There are many verses in the Bible that say you can profane the blood of Christ. You can trample the blood of Christ. Your name can be blotted out of the book of life, like it says in John 3, 5. Listen to what Hebrews 10, 26 says. For if we sin willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins, but a certain expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour his adversaries. And then in verse 29, it talks about how you're trampling the blood of the Son of God underfoot, etc., etc. That's clear that you can lose your salvation. It's not once and for all. And just because you're in the blood doesn't mean you can't profane it later on through your own free will and choice of action. Also, listen to what 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven 27 says. 
Paul here says, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So he talks about how people have died because they have profaned the body and blood of the Lord. They'll be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord by not Eat, by not discerning his body and blood and eating in an unworthy manner from the Lord's Supper. So there's many ways that you can profane the blood just because you're in it now and just because you stand in the gospel now doesn't mean you will in the future. Just ask the many Protestant pastors who have really served God for decades and then fallen away through serious sin. Some of them come back, some of them don't. So nobody can know for certain if they're going to be saved or not, including this man, even though he thinks he can, he can't, because the Bible does not teach it. Nobody can know if they're saved, absolutely. The Catholic Church says that we can have a certainty, a moral certainty that we can be saved, but no one has an absolute certainty. We both agree that Jesus is the Savior. We both agree that he's the Lord of heaven and earth and the only way to salvation. And we both agree that it's his body and blood that saves us. But what we disagree on is the substitutionary atonement and that it's just faith alone and in a one-time moment and then you're good forever and you can do whatever you want. Although some people say if you're truly saved, you wouldn't do whatever you want. Others say it doesn't matter. You could become an atheist or a murderer and you're still saved. Yes, there are Protestants who teach that, prominent Protestants. But the bottom line is the true biblical model of faith is one that lives itself out for Christ in love for him by his grace, is obedient to his will and his commandments, bears good fruit, and stays faithful until the end. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope it was helpful for you. We hope that it helped, to see, <laughs> helped you to see that what people say about Catholicism, what Catholicism actually teaches, is not always accurate. And what people say the Bible teaches and what the Bible actually teaches is not all, always accurate. If you want to know what the Bible actually teaches and how to properly interpret it, go back and read the writings of the earliest Christians for the first 500 years. The people who were the closest to Christ. The people who received the message directly from the apostles and their successors. You won't find Protestant theology among them. They all taught about the church, baptismal regeneration, the true presence of the Eucharist, and many, many more things. Uh, the importance of the church, tradition. I mean, not, not, no faith alone, no Bible alone. You really, really have to rip out passages out of the uh, early church fathers out of context to really try to prove those Protestant doctrines. But please challenge you to go back and read the earliest Christians unbiased. Just go read what they had to say without any Protestant Catholic glasses. Just read them and see what they have to say. Make sure if you have any questions to leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. Please like and subscribe if you're new here. We'd love to have you get our videos when they come out, usually Thursdays and Sundays. And if you would like to support our ministry, check out our PayPal and our Patreon down below so that we can keep saving millions of lives and keep bringing people home to the Catholic faith. God bless you.